Hello and welcome to the Gospel Project message, The Church is United by Faith. I believe this, this lesson could as easily be called The Church is United by the Law. <gasps> what? Um, maybe I shouldn't say that up front, but by the time we're finished, um, you'll see what I mean, and um, hopefully it'll make sense. Uh, the lesson begins with a, a discussion of television shows and movies, um, uh, adventure movies, even horror movies, even children's movies, often set up a, a scenario that seems to the viewer to be uh, rather obvious in, in a sense that we want to, the book says, yell at the screen and say, no, don't go in there, or hey, do this, it's obvious, that's what you should do. But the purpose of a story is to create a, 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 some situation that needs to be resolved. And sometimes they do that by having the characters get into circumstances that we think they should be able to avoid. But we do the same thing to ourselves. Um, it's not uncommon. It's, and it's what makes those stories, those movies, those television shows seem plausible and entertaining to us. Because we often look and think, well, you know, that could be me or you or that person over there. So Paul in Galatians is uh, sort of taking that approach of, um, of arguing with them in a sense of you, you should know better than this. You, you, uh, if you were seeing someone else in the situation, you would tell them this, and so I'm telling you this, and and that's that's the sort of the attitude that that he has toward them at this time. So I'm going to share what I hope is our first set of verses. Uh, yes, faith in Christ, not the law, is what justifies us as sinners. And he says, you foolish Galatians, he's serious about this, who has cast a spell on you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing in what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the Spirit, are you now finishing by the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing if in fact it was for nothing? So then does God give you the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law? Or is it by believing what you heard? Just like Abraham, who believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. So Paul really brings the point to them that you're saved by grace. Do you then have to finish that salvation with works? Obviously not. But he puts it to them over and over again. God saves you by a miracle. Then does he require you to perform a miracle to save yourself? Are you going to finish what you started in the spirit, in belief, in trusting God? with then requiring or tagging on works that you have to accomplish in order to achieve that goal of salvation. And, and that's his question to them. That, that's what uh, all of these verses are asking, except at the end where he says, Abraham was credited just for believing God. Abraham, and this is an interesting point, among Christians in the U.S., according to a recent poll, uh, many of them, over half of them, placed Moses before Abraham in the timeline. They believe that Moses and the law started the Jewish faith and that Abraham was born somewhere down the line. I don't really know where I'm going with that point, but, but it's a fact. Abraham was the first Jew. The Israelites are descended from Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham had no scripture. He had no Bible. He had only God speaking to him. And he believed and he trusted and he believed enough to, 
to leave his home, his country, his people, and travel to a different land and claim that land for himself. And he believed enough even ultimately to be willing to sacrifice his only son. So that was credited to him for righteousness. That is stated multiple times in the Bible. If that was true for him, why would it not be true for us that our belief is what justifies us? The fill in the blanks, if you have the book for this section, says special revelation refers to God's revealing himself to humanity through historical events, his word, and through Jesus Christ. Through special revelation, human beings learn about God's character, his will, his purpose for creation, and his plan for redemption. All of the Old Testament points to Christ. All of the Old Testament is written to demonstrate to us that Christ is the Messiah, that God's salvation through Christ is our redemption to him. We don't tack the law in the Old Testament in works and acts on top of that. Those are all things that point to the fact that salvation is a gift. It is free, and it's something that we can't accomplish on our own. So what is the purpose of the law then? Paul reasonably continues with a, a beginning of the of a description of the law and then giving a purpose of the law so that it's not just hanging out there. It does exist. It's been the Jewish law for hundreds of years. And, and it was given by God. So there must be a purpose for it. So rather than him just saying, you don't need that anymore, because that's not true. He goes on to make them aware of the function of the law. Of, and, and more than in a, in a traditional or historical or Jewish sense, but how it applies to us all. So again, I have to figure out how to share the screen every time I do it. Okay, so in our second set of verses, and this is Galatians 3, verses 10 through 14, he says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, Everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteousness will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Jesus Christ so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. So in the same way that Abraham was justified by believing, Gentiles are able to be justified by believing in Jesus Christ. The Jews considered themselves, by and large, justified by the law. But that was never true. No Jewish person ever observed the law completely and correctly other than Christ Jesus. So their salvation, their redemption, even when they had the law, was in their belief, in their trusting, in a coming Messiah, in a Redeemer. Job's salvation was believing that his Redeemer lived and, and would stand in the latter day, not observing the law, but his belief. So, so Paul says, you know, first he sets up the scenario here. No, nobody can be justified by the law because we can't live by the law. Everybody knows that. That's not an arguable point. So Jesus did that for us. I'm, I'm going to use a, an analogy here because I'm, 
I'm not sure of any other way to say this. Um, the voice in church history that the book list here is A.W. Tozer. Love that name. Through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated, but satisfied when God spares a sinner. The just penalty for sin was exacted when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. However unpleasant this may sound to the ear of the natural man, it has ever been sweet to the ear of faith. If someone owes money to the bank, um, you know, Bob owes money to the bank. The bank looks at Bob and, and sees somebody that owes them money, sees somebody that has a debt, sees somebody that has an outstanding loan that needs payment, that requires payment. If I don't have a loan from the bank, and I don't owe them any money, when they look at me, they see someone who is paid up, who doesn't owe them anything. Um, be, because there is no outstanding debt. If I sign paperwork and sign Bob's loan over to me, at that moment, at that point, when the bank looks at Bob, they see someone who's all paid up. He does not owe anything. He, he is uh, debt-free. I'm the one now. When they look, they see that I owe the money. But then if I'm able to write a check and pay off the loan, when the bank looks at either one of us, they see a debt-free person that owes them nothing. That's what Christ did for us on the cross. When God the Father looks at me, he sees saying, I've broken the law. I'm separated from him, and there's no way I can pay that. I have no income, no method, no, no way to redeem myself from that. The only way to redeem myself from that would be to live my entire life observing the law flawlessly, and that didn't happen, and it's not going to happen. I can't even do that from this point forward. And when the Father looked at Jesus, as, as a person, as a human, he saw someone who owed him nothing, who was still united with him, who had not broken the law, who was debt-free. When Jesus died on the cross, he signed my sin, my loan over to himself, so that when the Father looks at me, I owe nothing. I'm debt-free. I'm a perfect observer of the law because Jesus took that loan that sin, that brokenness away from me and put it on himself so that when God looked at him on the cross, he saw sin, he saw debt, he saw brokenness. And Jesus paid the penalty for that in dying, in being separated from the Father. And he paid that, that price for me. But, because Jesus is also God, because Jesus is sinless, because Jesus was able to observe the law, he was able to conquer death. He was able to conquer sin. He was able to rise, purified. And now when the Father looks at either one of us, he sees sinlessness. He sees righteousness. He sees... Um, he sees debt-free people in me, in Jesus' mouth. Um, in, imputation is the word that we use. And the fill in the blanks for this section says, when God pardoned sinners at the cross, our sin was imputed to Christ. He took that, that payment that we owed on himself. And Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. His debt-free righteousness was imputed to us. When God the Father looks at those who have trusted in Christ, he does not see their sins, but their righteousness of Christ belonging to them.
because Christ willingly gave it to us when he died on the cross. And then he recovered from that in his own power because he is the Son of God. So if we can't observe the law and we are having to trust entirely in faith in, in Christ, death and redemption and power to absolve us of our sins, then what is the purpose of the law? That's not in it. Here we go. So Paul goes on to say in verses 21 through 26, is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? And that's a good question. But he says, absolutely not. For if the law had been granted the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. Excuse me. So what is the purpose of the law? It acts as a guardian. It acts as a promise for the coming redeemer. Job understood that. Moses understood that. Abraham, even without the law, understood that that redemption was coming, that everything God said to him was a promise for the future. But Paul says now, in the church age, we're looking back to the fulfillment of that promise. So we no longer are living under the law, looking forward to the promise. We're living after the promise is fulfilled, but there's still this law out there. So what do we do with it? We do the same thing they do. We use it as a guardian. We use it as a as a uh, as a defense. Um, John, or rather Jesus, John records Jesus saying. Maybe I should say in uh, chapter 15, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. And the key word there is keep. Because when we say keep the law, in English, we tend to mean observe the law, obey the law. And we tend to view the law as a series of checklists of do's and don'ts. And keeping it means filling in that checklist for myself. And it also can act as a checklist for me to you. If I'm looking at you with the law in my hand, you know, I can check out they do these things. I see them do these things. I see them not doing these things. I see them doing these things that the law says they shouldn't do. Because that, that's kind of our interpretation of keeping the law. But the word keep, the Greek word keep in this scripture, and in fact, every time that Jesus refers to keeping the law, is actually a word that means to value something's ability to act as a guardian, as protection, as a, as a defense. Jesus always described the law in terms of God giving it to us in order for us to use it to defend ourselves against sin. It's not so much a checklist for us to avoid sin in the sense of what we say keeping the law keeps us from sinning, but observing, I'm going to say believing in the Using the law as our defense keeps us from willfully sinning. Um, Jesus gave us this an example early, gave us this example early 
when he was in the wilderness and Satan tempted him. Jesus's answer was scripture. Jesus quoted the law as his defense against Satan's temptation. So it's still, the law is still there. It's still God's word. It's still God's, God's outline for how we should live. Jesus, in fulfilling the law, gives us in the gospel an example of how to live using the law as a defense mechanism, as, um, as a safeguard, rather than a domineering kind of law, which is what we you know, sometimes consider it to be. So I, I encourage you through the week to understand that our salvation is in Christ. The most dangerous thing we can do is tack things onto that, especially as a witness. If people can see in us and understand in us that the love of Christ, that that, that commandment to love God and love our neighbors is pointing to his salvation, to salvation through faith in his death and resurrection, then they're looking at something that, that's new, that's different, that they're not used to, that will draw them. If they see us living our lives in terms of do's and don'ts and trying to observe this and that, and they're thinking that we as Christians are requiring them to follow certain steps and procedures in order to be saved. That's just another set of do's and don'ts. They already have traffic laws and tax laws and everybody's on a diet and everybody has structures and these routines that they have to follow. Why am I going to add church to that? So it can become a stumbling block. We don't want that to happen. And that's what was happening in Galatia. There were so many requirements that Christians were imposing on people in order for them to be part of the Christian faith that people were just not paying attention or, or saying no or not pursuing any interest in Christ or the Spirit or following this God of the Hebrews. And so Paul, you know, in, in the beginning, calling them foolish, putting his foot down, making a big show of this, is saying to them, you, you can't do this, not, not for yourselves, you're already saved, but for those who are not. Part of your witness has to be them understanding or, or at least seeing that your salvation comes from Christ and that all these big long lists of do's and don'ts in the law are actually what you use to protect yourself from sin, to protect yourself from temptation, to guard yourself and, and value it as part of your relationship with God, not some kind of heavy, bulky load that you have to endure. So that... That's Paul's lesson, and it's still applicable to us today, that um, we want to reach others, and we want to do that through love, and we want to do that through understanding, and we want to do that through uh, acceptance and not barreling down on ourselves or other people, um, using the law more as a weapon or more as a checklist than we do as part of our relationship with God and, and appreciate and, uh, and care for it in our lives as much as we, as we value Jesus's presence and the Spirit's presence in our heart. So with that lesson, thank you for joining. And um, I'll close us now with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for these who are watching and pray, Lord, that um, that as your word goes out, that uh, that their their hearts will dwell and will seek and will continue to learn 
in in grow, Lord. I pray that as we study our Bibles through the week and as we speak to others, that uh, that your Spirit will work in our hearts and our minds and draw us closer to you, and uh, and help us, Lord, to to share that closeness and that love with others so that they may be your children as well. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Bye. I'll see you next time.